If we do go back to the structure of nucleic acids, we want to keep in mind that nucleic acids are macromolecules. They are the largest molecules that we do have inside of a cell, and they are definitely considered polymers. So by polymers, they are made up of smaller subunits that are hooked together many, many times. Those smaller subunits are called nucleotides. So here we have a look at a nucleotide. A nucleotide has three components to it. It does have a nitrogenous base or a nitrogen containing base, a pentose, which would be a five carbon sugar, and then it also has a phosphate group. Now we'll look at those parts in a little more detail in just a moment, but we do wanna point out that there are two different types of nucleic acids that you can find inside cells, and that's deoxyribonucleic acid, otherwise known as DNA, and then we also have ribonucleic acid, which is RNA. The two are very similar to each other in structure, but they do play very different roles inside the cell. If we zoom in on those nucleotides and we talk about the individual components of them a little bit more, the nitrogenous base component is just a nitrogen containing base. We can divide the bases into two categories. They can be purines or pyrimidines. And when we're talking about the purines, these are going to be larger bases. They are double ring structures, as you see here. So basically two rings fused together, a hexagon fused to a pentagon. And the two representative purines that we have that you find in nucleotides are adenine and guanine. Now typically the bases are just referred to by the first letter. So this would be A and G. As far as the pyrimidines are concerned, they are smaller. They are single ring structures. All of them are hexagon rings. And we have cytosine, thymine, and uracil. And again, these are referred to by the first letter in their name. Now, any one of these five bases could be in that nitrogenous base position of the nucleotide. However, there is a little bit of a difference when we're talking about DNA versus RNA. This difference comes in the thymine and the uracil. Thymine is only found in DNA, and uracil is only found in RNA. So what that means is that if we're looking at DNA, the possible bases that you can find there would be A, T, C, or G. If we're talking about RNA, our possible bases would be A, U, C, and G. So we have four possibilities for both RNA and DNA, and we want to know what the difference is and the bases that you could find in them. Now, if we move on to talk about the pentose sugar component. With the pentose sugar, it is definitely a five carbon sugar, and that's why we call it a pentose. And this is really where the names come from. DNA always has deoxyribose as the pentose sugar, and RNA always has ribose as the pentose sugar. Now the only difference between the two is that we've got an extra hydroxyl group here in the ribose that you don't find in the deoxyribose, so it is missing there. But that one difference between the two sugars does affect the overall structure of the molecule, which is ultimately going to affect the role of the nucleic acid inside the cell. So we have quite different roles with DNA versus RNA. So with every nucleotide that you find in DNA, it is gonna have the deoxyribose sugar, and then it will have either the A, T, C, or G in the base position. With every RNA nucleotide, you will have the ribose sugar with A, U, C, or G. As far as the phosphate group is concerned, there's no variety there. A phosphate group always looks the same. So that will be the same in DNA versus RNA. Now another thing we wanna point out about the nucleotides is a lot of times you hear the three prime end referred to or the five prime end referred to. So if we point out what those numbers are standing for, those numbers have to do with the numbering of the carbons and the sugar. So if we look over here, this would really be the number one sugar, this would be number two, we see number three is here, this would be four, and then here we have our number five carbon up there. Now if you look at what's attached to the number three carbon and the number five carbon, if we initially look at the number three, notice that the number three carbon, which is right here in the deoxyribose and right here in the ribose, no matter what is attached to a hydroxyl group. 
So we always have a hydroxyl group coming off of the three prime carbon. And the five prime carbon, no matter what, is going to be attached to this phosphate group right here. So we want to keep in mind, anytime we hear the five prime end, we should be thinking phosphate because that is what's attached to that five prime carbon. And anytime we hear three prime, we should be thinking sugar end, or you could be thinking hydroxyl group. So we will refer quite a lot to the five prime versus the three prime in chapter 16 and 17. So we want to definitely make sure that we get that part down pat. Now the way that these are going to be joined together to make a polymer will be by connecting the five prime end of one to the three prime end of the next one. So the nucleotide polymers are going to take this five prime phosphate right here and we will basically connect it right to what was the hydroxyl group here on the three prime end. So we connect the five prime phosphate to the three prime sugar. Or we could say the three prime hydroxyl group. Now when we do this, we are going to create a special linkage. So we would have one of those linkages here, here, and here. And this linkage is known as a phosphodiester linkage. So notice here we have connected together four nucleotides and we're going to have three phosphodiester linkages there. No matter how many linkages we make or how many nucleotides we connect together, we will always have one end that is going to be the three prime end and we will always have one end that's going to be the five prime end. So our nucleic acids always have these two unique ends on them. Now specifically in this picture, we're looking at DNA and we know that it is DNA first off because we're looking at deoxyribose for the sugar. So notice that there is no hydroxyl group here on the number two carbon the whole way down. And another way that we could tell that this is DNA is by the presence of the thymine base. Keep in mind that we're never going to find thymine when we're looking at RNA. So we know that this is definitely DNA here. Notice the part that is shaded in light blue. That is what we typically call the backbone of the molecule. Notice that the backbone does not involve the nitrogenous bases whatsoever, or the connecting together of the nucleotides does not involve the nitrogenous bases. If we look at the backbone, notice that it is alternating phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, and so on the whole way down. So we're always going to see that alternation of the phosphates and the sugars. The bases, on the other hand, they're going to be sticking out to the side. Now, if we're looking at a piece of DNA, the phosphates and the sugars are going to be exactly the same the whole way down. So when we talk about the sequence of DNA, we're really just interested in the bases because that will be the part that is going to be unique about DNA. So the sequence of the bases will be unique. When we write a DNA sequence, we always start with the five prime end when we write it. And then we would just go through and we would list those bases that are present. So in this case, if we're starting at the five prime end, our five prime end is up at the top. So this sequence would be T, A, C, G. So notice that the three prime end is the end that we ended with when we wrote this. Now fairly early on, they did understand that DNA was composed of nucleotides and that there was a nitrogenous base, a sugar component, and then also a phosphate. What they didn't know was the actual three-dimensional shape of the molecule and how that molecule was able to really encode all of the information necessary for running a cell. So there were many groups that were working on the structure of DNA and just trying to unravel how DNA was able to accomplish so much inside the cell. One of the people that was working on this was Edwin Shargaff. And what Edwin Shargaff was looking at specifically was he was looking at the base composition. So he analyzed in many different species, um, a wide range of species, so plants, animals, bacteria, fungi, you name it. He looked at the DNA in those organisms and he determined how much of the DNA was composed of 
thymine nitrogenous bases versus what percentage of the DNA was composed of adenine or cytosine or guanine. And he made a comparison between the different organisms that he looked at to determine if they all were very consistent in the amount or percentage of T versus A, C, or G. What he found was that the percentages of the bases were highly variable depending on what organism he was actually looking at. But he did come up with a few rules. What he found was that no matter what organism he looked at, the percent of the A was always equal to the percent of T, no matter what. And the percentage of C was always equal to the percentage of G. Now he didn't know exactly why these rules worked the way that they did, but it did always come out like this. So for example, if he looked at a certain plant and that plant was found to have 20% adenine inside of it, he could right away go through and predict what the percentage of thymine was going to be in there, and then also the percentage of cytosine and guanine. So if he knew that he had 20% A, then no matter what, he did have 20% T, and that together would equal 40%, which means that he had left over a remaining 60% that would be divided up between the C and the G. So in that example, he would also have 30% C and he would have 30% G. Now another thing to notice about his rules is that notice that it is always one purine equal to one pyrimidine. So the A is a purine and it's equal to the T which is a pyrimidine and the guanine over here is a purine and it is equal to a pyrimidine which is the C here. So one of the things that you want to be able to do in chapter 16 is to take the percentage of one base and figure out what the percentages of all of the other three bases would be inside of a specific organism. There are some practice problems with regards to that, so make sure that you can do that and make sure you understand what Chargaff's rules were. So basically A's are equal to T's and C's are equal to G's. Now again, he didn't know why the rules worked out that way and he didn't know the overall three-dimensional structure of DNA. There were additional groups that were working on the structure of DNA. One of the individuals that was working on it was Rosalind Franklin. Rosalind Franklin was using a technique called X-ray crystallography to study molecular structure of molecules. Specifically, she was studying the structure of DNA. With this technique, a crystal is produced of a particular molecule, in this case DNA, and that crystal is a repeating arrangement of a molecule over and over and over again. Once the crystal is made, then x-rays are basically focused on that crystal and they will bounce off at different angles depending on the actual shape of the molecule. So Rosalind Franklin had come up with a crystal of DNA. She did use x-ray crystallography and come up with a picture of DNA. So this picture that we're seeing on this slide, this is a very famous picture. It's called Photo 51. It's the first picture of DNA. And although this picture doesn't look like a whole lot to the untrained eye or someone that's not used to looking at crystallography data, what this picture said to Rosalind Franklin was that DNA is helical. Okay, so she said it is some kind of a helix structure. And it also told her that the sugars and phosphates are on the outside. So she knew that the sugars and the phosphates were on the outside of the molecule and she knew that somehow there was a helix going on there. Other than that, she didn't really know what was going on yet. Two other individuals, James Watson and Francis Crick, they were also working on the structure of DNA they looked at and analyzed the x-ray crystallography data that Rosalind Franklin had collected. So they looked at that photo 51 and they expanded on her concepts. So they said it was a helix, but more specifically DNA was a double helix. And they also agreed with her conclusion that the sugars and the phosphates were on the outside of the molecule. And they published their data in 1953. 
They publish not only a, an in-depth structure of DNA, but they also propose a mechanism for the replication or the copying process of DNA. These two individuals have since won the Nobel Prize for their work in discovering the structure of DNA. If we talk in more detail about their conclusions as far as the structure of DNA is concerned, they said that it is a double helix. So first off, by saying that DNA is a double helix, we're saying that it is double-stranded. Okay, so by double-stranded, DNA is made up of two polynucleotides, so two long chains of nucleotides hooked together. And these double strands, they do run in opposite directions. So we call the fact that they run in opposite directions anti-parallel. So if you look here, what we mean by that is that the five prime end of one is across from the three prime end of the other strand. And notice we have the same thing going on on this other end here. Additionally, if you think of the DNA molecule as a ladder, the poles or side supports of the ladder do have the alternating sugars and phosphates the whole way down, just as Rosalind Franklin had concluded. And then in addition to that, on the inside of the molecule, where our rungs of the ladder would be, that is where we find the nitrogenous bases. The nitrogenous bases happen to be what actually holds the two strands of the molecule together. Specifically, the bases are held together by hydrogen bonds, and those hydrogen bonds form specifically between A and T, which is exactly why A was always equal to T in Edwin Shargaff's rules, and the C's and G's are always hydrogen bonded to each other, which is why the C was always equal to the G. So here we see the molecular basis for Shargaff's rules. If DNA is always double-stranded, that means that whenever you happen to have an A in one molecule, you will without a doubt have a T in the other side or in the other strand. And if you ever have a C, you will also have a G across from that. Now it's important to understand that these hydrogen bonds are relatively weak bonds, but when we add together as many as we have, in a DNA molecule, it makes for a very, very strong interaction. DNA molecules are very long inside the cell. We're typically talking about a couple hundred million nucleotides long. And if you consider that you have two to three hydrogen bonds between each of those couple hundred million nucleotides, that's a lot of hydrogen bonds. So it is going to hold the strands very tightly together. We also want to make sure we understand that between the A's and the T's, we're always going to have two hydrogen bonds. Between the C's and the G's, there will always be three hydrogen bonds. Another thing to keep in mind here is that notice it is always a purine. So on this side, we have our purines that's going to be across from a pyrimidine over here. What this is going to do is it's going to make sure that we always have a consistent width down the DNA molecule. As you can imagine, if we happen to have two purines across from each other, that would be an enlarged region in the DNA molecule. If we happen to have two pyrimidines across from each other, that would be a shrunken in area. So by keeping one purine always across from a pyrimidine, we have a nice consistent width. So on this slide, we're just summing up what Watson and Crick proposed for the structure of DNA. They said that DNA molecules consist of two polynucleotide chains, so two strands of DNA that form a double helix. So they twist around in a helical fashion. They spiral around an imaginary axis would be another way to say it. The chains always run in opposite directions from each other. We call that anti-parallel. And that means the five prime end of one is always across from the three prime end of the other. The sugar phosphate backbones are always on the outside of the helix. And the bases are always going to be on the inside of the helix. Furthermore, the chains are held together by hydrogen bonding between the bases. And we do call those bases paired bases. So many times when talking about DNA, you'll hear people say the base pairs or the base pairing rule. And what that means is going back to the fact 
that A is always across from T and C is always across from G. So those are our base pairs, A's with T's and C's with G's. Additionally, we do have a little bit of van der Waals interactions taking place in the DNA structure, and those van der Waals interactions occur between stacked bases, which will be one rung of the ladder versus the next rung of the ladder.